I love architecture, and um, how can we not have a session in a wonderful symposium on the Bauhaus without talking about the Bauhaus's relationship to architecture and modernism, how modern architecture has extracted from what we learned at the Bauhaus School. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to our panel, led by Jeffrey Burkus. You're sitting in a room that he designed. Uh, he designed this entire building and the Isaacson Center for the Aspen Institute, so we're delighted to have Jeffrey leading this. Um, also, our colleagues Barry Bergdahl, whom you've heard from before, uh, Dietrich Newman, and Melissa Venator. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming, and welcome to this mandala, which is actually derivative of the Bauhaus School, as you can see in many ways. And hopefully, over the next 40 minutes, you'll hear more about what are the pieces of Bauhaus. And in terms of the architectural style, which as we've been talking about it, really is not a style, but a way of thinking or seeing. But of course, we'll jump right back into a little bit of style because there are the elements which are distinct to Bauhaus and potentially different than the international movement and the modern movement. And I'm hoping that our panel experts will talk to that a little bit. The framework will be a little bit different. It'll be an open conversation. I want a little 2020 vision in this 40 minutes where we'll talk for the first 20 minutes and then the second 20 minutes we'll engage the audience. So you are a meaningful part of this. So be thinking about the questions that you have that relate specifically to the uh, Bauhaus and architecture. And that'll come up after um, 20 minutes. So I wanted to start with the idea that we are all here for and by design. This is a common passion and this is at the basic tenets of the Bauhaus with all of us and with all of you, and that'll be a common thread in, in what we talk about. So the Bauhaus School of Architecture was really a radical experiment in the educational process of designers and, and architects. It wasn't tr traditional in any way. And while it was short-lived, it had a big impact. So I would like to start with our panel members talking about what what are those basic tenets, elements of Bauhaus architect that we can take away as lay people that are the vocabulary for this movement and style? There'll be a rolling screen of slides. It's not that we'll be talking to the slides. These are for reference for the visual. But Barry, maybe you could kick us off with that. Oh, gosh. I didn't realize the heavy task, the heavy lifting was going to well, you It's going to be a conversation, so you're all sure. going to join in very, very quickly, but um, we wanted at least some images rolling be, uh, behind your head. Uh, one of the 10 things to know about the Bauhaus that Leah and I uh, offered to you, although we could have offered 100 uh, on the opening evening, was the paradox that the Bauhaus put architecture, or at least Bau, uh, a building at the center of its curricular diagram, but yet didn't offer architectural education uh, until halfway through its uh, short existence. And yet today, uh, we speak so confidently about Bauhaus architecture and Bauhaus style in architecture. So this leaves us with a, a bit of a paradox or a conundrum to try to, uh, to pick apart. Uh, the images that are floating by on the screen are largely buildings that are um, indisputably Bauhaus architecture because they're built by the Bauhaus for its own use. Uh, and so one of our questions is obviously what characteristics do they uh, have in, in common that might define the Bauhaus style. However, if they hadn't become so famous, I think, by their association uh, with the school, uh, particularly in its second location in Dessau, and I intermingled uh, here, or the four of us intermingled into this slide presentation photographs of other avant-garde European architecture of exactly the same period, uh, you might not see a very radical difference between those and the buildings that are going by uh, on, the, um, on the screen. And I think that that is a very important thing uh, to emphasize because I think that what we now call Bauhaus architecture is probably comes from something that we heard of with Nicole Saval, uh, the vicissitudes of the uh, Bauhaus in its reputation much later on. Uh, and I think in Gropius's time, Although I maybe gave a little bit of a conspiracy theory last night by showing you the book International Architecture and saying Gropius was trying to co-opt the uh, European avant-garde and brand it as Bauhaus, one could, I think, maybe uh, 
turn it around and say Gropius wanted to show how much what they were doing belonged to a network or a larger movement. He wanted to amplify the importance of what he was doing uh, in order to show uh, that it connected uh, with a sensibility that was emerging, as he would like to think, among progressive, right-minded people who thought of themselves as modern, um, uh, might be the more uh, accurate way, perhaps, of interpreting his gesture. Just one final thought, so I don't dominate the, the uh, conversation. <clears throat> I think, and we were discussing this while we were planning this uh, conversation um, this morning, uh, for many people, the kind of slippage between modern, modernism, international style, Bauhaus architecture, uh, is very difficult to uh, sort out. Uh, and they are probably more to be thought of as like Charles and Ray Eames would have powers of 10, uh, of different ways of framing, looking at essentially the same uh, interrelated um, elements uh, of a phenomena. I think what is key to understand is that all of these things that were grouped together in Gropius's idea of international architecture, which eventually that, that title was taken over by uh, the uh, creators of the first architecture show at the Museum of Modern Art, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson. They uh, rather, um, what's the word I should say? They uh, rather inappropriately put the word style into that title. Uh, then they, they created a problem already for us in 1932. We talked about that a lot. Um, but they were essentially talking about the same uh, group of buildings. But I think the key thing that lies all of these things together uh, was the notion of wanting to be a modernist. That was to accept fully that one lived in a time that was thought to be distinct from other times, that one was wanting to take signals from the, the realities of the moment, whether they be uh, the capacities of industry to create an industrializable building, uh, whether they be the relinquishing of social norms that no longer demanded that you uh, separate the reception of visitors from your family and your house, and therefore you could rethink the very way that you lived. All of these things were thought of as aspects of modern culture, and to be a modernist artistically was to want to seek to find the expression for embodying those realities of the present. So over and over again, this idea of art, in the Museum of Modern Art would say art of our time, but in Germany, you would have many publications on the, the Baukunst unserer Zeit of our time. So I think that this notion of modernism is something that the Bauhaus um, shared with uh, many others. Uh, if we want to, we can pick apart how some of these other terms came to be glued to it, but they're not, they're not particularly helpful if we lose from sight, I think, what was the core initiative that Gropius shared with uh, many others. And I just one last uh, thought uh, tangentially related um, to a little bit reverse some of the polemic that I've been putting forth here on my opportunities over the last uh, 24 hours, and Dietrich uh, brought this up very clearly. Gropius was charged with combining two schools, neither of which taught architecture. There was a technical school in Weimar that taught architecture, so his charge was not to create an architecture school. The curious thing is that the local authorities chose after the war to entrust these two schools to an architect. So there's, an, a, there's a kind of evolving set of paradoxes there, and there are many ways, I think, to explain that reluctance or that slowness to get to, uh, to, get to architecture. So those are just some random thoughts. Yeah. I think I shouldn't dominate the discussion, or it's not a discussion. No, uh, <laughs> that's a good, uh, a good point, but I uh, think it's important to see that this term, Bauhaus style, that uh, we wanted to talk about for a moment, became, became a very convenient shorthand for a formal vocabulary that is clearly there. And, you know, we, in our discussion this morning, we talked about very important is the flat roof, and white stucco was, became sort of the lingua franca, and that happened in many countries in Europe at the same time. And the Bauhaus, of course, contributed to it, but it became more of a sort of propaganda instrument for others. As Barry just mentioned, the exhibition in 23 about international architecture would show that the Bauhaus was part of something that was happening in France and in Switzerland and, and especially in the Netherlands, but also in the Czech Republic. There's fantastic work 
done that all follows this vocabulary, it has flat roofs, as impractical as, as they were, of course, they all leaked, every single one of them. But uh, there was a vocabulary, and one has to say also, it's a vocabulary that one could pick up very easily. It's not very difficult to understand how you put these cubes together and put uh, uh, windows uh, in and, and uh, assemble those elements. And so it, had, it was easy to spread it. And of course, it came, came with the idea that it was also um, maybe easier to build you know, with industrial mm -hmm. methods and so on. It all came along. But I think it's uh, important to see that it became the shorthand for a style that was uh, ubiquitous. It was still a very small um, uh, portion of the output anywhere, I would guess, in Germany in the 1920s. The buildings in the, in the sort of modern Bauhaus style with flat roofs and white stucco facades were perhaps 1 or 2 percent of the overall building production. There was still a lot of uh, pitched roofs uh, going on in Germany at the same time. But it became a shorthand, which I think is still useful uh, for us today, even if we acknowledge that there wasn't much architecture, apart from the few examples you see here that was actually produced at the Bauhaus itself. Yeah. And building on what Dietrich just said, mentioning the flat roofs, I actually wanted to turn the tables. You guys have seen the whole slide deck now. It's advanced through. So briefly, I was wondering if we could get an inventory of the room. What do you think the defining characteristics of this architecture are? So Dietrich mentioned flat roofs, and maybe Barry's looking at me somewhat quizzically. I'm just, it's a, it's a sense that this, this style that we're not supposed to call a style is very familiar to us. And I'm curious, because I think there will be a lot of consensus in the room about what these defining characteristics are. So just rectangles. Exactly. Glass. Exploration. Exploration. Minimal. Minimal. Mm. Asymmetry. Hmm. Lack of, what was that? Functionalism. Gropius thanks you for that. <laughs> Experimentation. Experimentation. Graphic. Graphic. In what way? Lines. Excellent. Anyone else? Boxy. Boxy. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, response Not to. Not ergonomic. No. I don't know. Some of the, some, there are some curves. The responses from the panel about yeah, any think, of these qualities? So that's a, that's a really interesting list right there, and you can surround yourself in it. There were steel C channels that normally cap the flat roofs, which you'll see in this building. The um, question earlier about what about the curtain wall? Well, steel allowed, as steel was strong, it allowed for greater expanses of glass. So the boxiness, which originally started with Bauhaus, went into more and more glass because the curtain walls would allow for that. And then that interface uh, with, between humans and nature became much closer. So that would be the next question I was getting into is that in the early tenants of the Bauhaus, nature isn't as readily apparent as part of the style. And when did that really start to become more and more a part of the tenant? Well, there's an interesting uh, sort of part of this whole uh, development is that uh, maybe I should begin with uh, one of the criticisms that uh, mm -hmm. contemporaries leveled at this mm -hmm. style uh, was, and they, not everyone who didn't like Bauhaus architecture was necessarily right wing or a Nazi or narrow minded. There were a lot of critics <laughs> who just looked at it and didn't, didn't care for it that much. And they might often say, this architecture looks like factories or hospitals or ships. Uh, like it could move away, famous uh, philosopher Ernst Bloch uh, writes about it in the, those terms. And hospitals is really an interesting reference point because uh, this style seemed very conducive to tuberculosis hospitals. And there are some really beautiful ones in the 20s. Alva Aalto and many others come to mind. And they, in fact, ref uh, reference this sort of closeness to nature that mm -hmm. the wide open windows and the balconies everywhere could provide. So there's a direct connotation there, uh, um, uh, as you pointed out. And the maximization of natural light, which was considered an important healing mm -hmm. quality yeah. uh, before there were antibiotics that could heal so many diseases. I think all of those things, it's, it's important. It's rather hard for us because of the success of this architecture of the 1920s. And then um, you know, its proliferation as a point of departure for architecture after the Second World War it's a little hard for us sometimes to see these buildings as they would have been seen by their contemporaries. 
and not only, as Dietrich said, did not everybody like them, but to put it positively, the one thing that didn't come from the audience, very interesting what you didn't respond to, mm -hmm. because of course you see them from 21st century eyes. It's almost impossible for us, unless you spend your life as we do as historians, to try to recreate the way they might have been perceived mm -hmm. in the 1920s. And one of the most shocking things, besides the a flat roof and the, um, <clears throat> the dominance uh, or at least in black and white photography, mm -hmm. of whiteness um, is the complete lack of ornament, the complete lack of detailing. And so uh, they're no more boxy than many other buildings. It's just that the box is not decorated. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, windows are simply punched in. Uh, and so this, um, what was seen at the time is a very uh, cubic architecture. It's very difficult for us uh, to get back to the sense of the contrast with the uh, decorative ornaments, uh, what later in postmodernism Robert Venturi would call the kind of science, the sign systems uh, of, uh, that um, ornamented most boxes of the period, and that often referred to older styles of architecture, whether it was the classical tradition or whether it was the Gothic tradition that, uh, ironically enough, Gropius had celebrated with his embrace of the image of the cathedral at the beginning. So this, there in that, uh, house on Horn. Let's hope that's not typical of Bauhaus because it's such a bad <laughs> building. But anyway, um, the uh, you know the absolute absence of any molding on the outside, other than a simple windowsill to a little bit direct some of the water uh, to fall away. Uh, this complete in, uh, uh, desire to make simply the composition of the volumes of the building create light and shadow, rather than doing it through um, ornament. Uh, while the others were talking, I was thinking one of the ironies of this is, of course, uh, there is also this desire to make buildings that would be amenable to factory production, to make buildings that would be replicable and therefore could become affordable and therefore could become, this kind of picks up on some of the things that Nikel was telling us, that could become available to a much wider social class, to make uh, architecture uh, more democratic in its accessibility. All of these are tied up. Uh, with this, these initiatives to this very stripped down architecture. It's a little hard for us to see that uh, today rather than in the 1920s uh, perspective. But one irony I was thinking of is that, of course, first of all, the Bauhaus is not really produced by factory techniques other than the, the glass curtain wall. It's, in fact, a brick building that is meant to be looking like a radical steel building. We have mixed in here some images of Mies van der Rohe in Chicago, and in fact, uh, Mies only began to experiment with steel. Steel was not widely available, really, in, in, Germany, the, not at all. in yeah. Germany during this um, uh, period. So this is an extravagance to use it. But one of the ironies is this is a relatively traditionally built building with then these, um, these wonderful industrial gestures. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the most industrialized thing in the building industries around 1900 was the production of ornament. So this very ornament that is being <laughs> condemned is the one thing that can be replicated and uh, factory oh. produced. But it is associated with the idea of handcraft. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the uh, fear of this architecture was that signature, individuality, uh, making, the human touch, all of the tactile qualities of inherited architecture were being abolished and therefore some of the hostility to this architecture that might not have been political, it was just visceral. Yeah, exactly. And there were, you know, someone who is sort of considered the father of the modern movement in, in some ways, a man called Adolf Loos in Vienna wrote an essay that he entitled Ornament and Crime. And that was such a brilliant title. It was sort of somewhat uh, polemical and funny and so on, but that, that line just stuck with everybody and I think propelled this uh, movement forward. As we are looking at this and talking about factory and production in this building, I should mention that, of course, many of these uh, new formal approaches were supremely impractical. They were not necessarily always functional. And I'm thinking of that glass curtain wall that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. This is the time before air conditioning and this wall faces south and turned the workshops into a greenhouse mm -hmm. effect of uh, super hot summers where the sweat of the students would drip onto their drawing paper and only air conditioning has actually made uh, 
this type of modern architecture possible. Mises first house in the United States, uh, the, uh, the Farnsworth the house. Farnsworth Mrs. Farnsworth in this glass box was also, of course, sweating in, those, uh, sure. in the hot summers. Now it has air conditioning and works. It's beautiful. But there was a bit of a time lapse. This architecture really needs uh, technology that wasn't there at the moment when it was invented. And I wanted to just briefly add that while you know, the lack of ornament, the clean lines, the glass, these sort of industrial materials, it's almost like a style of no style, right? Because it's rejecting historical styles. But there was a very clear political statement, even if Gropius explained it as functionalism, um, you know, there is a clear rejection of vernacular German architectural styles, if you think of steeply pitched roofs of houses, of the gingerbread style ornamentation. Um, you know, this is not that. And at the time, a lot of the hostility that this architecture received was grounded in the fact that it seemed specifically anti-German to be rejecting kind of regional architectural identities. Exactly, that was one of the points the Nazis made, right? That it was uh, international, even Jewish, Bolshevik, Mediterranean, all of these things uh, came together and that one needed to return to a style that came out of the soil of Germany and had exactly. pitched roofs. That was part of the criticism that came up. Yeah. It's a perfect way to segue in these universal geometries that were used in the graphics that came into the buildings of the circle, sphere, triangle, pyramid, um, golden section. These are the forms that became the underpinnings for the Bauhaus. And what you will see in Bernard Chazar's next presentation with Bayer, Bayer is the one who really brought the fluidity of nature together with these geometries and, and expanded into the colors and geometries and into nature. So now, 20 minutes left, I, we'd like to open it up to the audience and get a dialogue going or a conversation about what is Bauhaus. Thank you, thank you. Um, so basically just what we were talking about or what you guys were talking about, um, it seems like one of the tenets was functionalism, but it seems to me that a, a, the roof is one of the most necessary parts of a building. And having, you know, a pitched roof seems to me the, or not, a, a flat roof seems the least functional of, of mm -hmm. the roofs. Um, it leaks, it's not good for snow, so on and so forth. I guess the, the question is, um, and with the curtain walls without AC, um, the question is, what, what, a, what was functional about, <laughs> like what, I get maybe the, you know, the interiors, but what was the actual function, at, you know, taking away the lack of ornaments, that's sort of a superficial thing, I get that, but what, what was the yeah. function? F flat lo roofs leak, right? That's one of these axioms. They don't so much anymore. We have learned how to waterproof roofs. Now, that wasn't my personal guarantee, but <laughs> <laughs> the flat roofs opened up roofscapes as very usable spaces. And it was novel, and people started utilizing the roof, which has the best view of everything. And Bayer put on top of his health center a wonderful sunbathing space. Mm -hmm. So the flat roofs actually were quite functional, and it was the first time that they were used that way. Yeah. and. Uh Briefly, also to distinguish between an architecture and, and kind of the radicality of saying, I will design this building specifically to optimize function, however I define that, and not to imitate a historical style. Now, whether in practical operation it actually was functional is kind of a separate, um, separate example. But for example, in Gropius's own homes that he designed in Lincoln and in Dessau, he would talk, and one thing that's very visible is the placement of the windows. So one of his claims to functionality was, I put the windows not to create a symmetrical facade, but where they're needed. So for instance, he places the bathroom near the front entrance of the house, and the bathroom, you need light, but you want privacy. So you have these thin ribbon windows at the top of the wall. So that's the kind of explanation of, of functionality that he would make in just one detail in his own home. But I think, just to add to this, you're absolutely right, putting your finger on this, this sort yes. of strong set of visuals, this strong formal drive that held all these people who were working in this style together and made it recognizable, is often at odds with the, the claim at the same time that this is an architecture based purely on the functionality of the yeah. plan. That is something that still keeps fascinating us as historians, I guess, to research you know, how, these, how this tension has worked out in each case.
It is where the style thing began to creep in because ultimately there is exactly what you put your, your finger on, this um, inherent conflict between what is literally functional, if we take mm -hmm. functional to mean performative, which is I think the way that you are using it, um, and what has the appearance of functionality. And this is where the very, that very core contradiction uh, I think actually creates some of the, uh, the gap into which this whole problem of style begins to um, appear so that uh, critics by the late 1920s are already talking about Bauhaus style. There's one very funny text in which the, the person says, everything in its contrary is Bauhaus style. So in the end, what is, what is Bauhaus style? But it is in that, that very, there is a strong ideology of what I spoke of earlier of a desire to appear modern. And so this, this drive to a modernist appearance is generating this problem of style, even if the discourse is one of functionality. In other words, the function made me do it. I'm not an artist, it just generated itself this way. Anybody who's ever tried to design a building knows that what you were talking about is one of the key problems. How do you get the windows exactly where you need them, and how do you not have the exterior of the building look like You're a chaotic mess? <laughs> <laughs> so Robin, we'll go back and forth the sides of the room. Um, I, I have a question. Um, you know, in thinking about how Bauhaus really influenced so many of the architects that were coming into the United States in the 50s and the 60s, high rises were being built. They were very boxy. They were very utilitarian. Um, and then all of a sudden, movements like postmodernism and Memphis and all these things, adornment really started to um, kind of push the limits. You, could, you couldn't throw enough on a building. And um, I'd love to hear your thoughts of kind of how that evolved, and then all of a sudden that was wrong, and we moved on to a, other extrapolations today of what there, we, were, we see influences are from. But just to get your input Petri, on you that. you kind of started with that, so that's, that's perfect. Sure, I'm happy to uh, try and answer to that. I think, first of all, I should probably say that a little bit in defense of Mies, he took great care detailing his buildings. Um, both proportionally and in the, in the materiality and so on, but there are many architects who followed who didn't have the means or the skills to do the same thing. And so there's a lot of really bad architecture that sort of follows in the wake of these immigrants of Mies in particular and others and SOM and all these firms, uh, which I think were rightly critiqued from the 60s on as being detrimental to uh, you know, urban uh, spatial developments, et cetera, et cetera, and then postmodern movement comes along and tries to rectify that situation. But almost every one of those uh, proponents of the postmodern movement would acknowledge that Mies van der Rohe was an exception. He was exceptionally good in what he did. Uh, Robert Venturi, for instance, who wrote Complexity and Contradiction, uh, and uh, Mies apparently, you know, uh, sort of, uh, there was a rumor that Mies at some point said, less is more. You've all heard that. I don't think he ever said that. I think it might have been Philip Johnson who came up with that, who was a very witty thinker, uh, quite different from me. So it was taciturn and slow, uh, but a great designer. Um, and Venturi said uh, uh, in response, less is a bore. But then he later in life uh, said, you know, I, I feel I have to acknowledge that Mies was just a really great architect. And I, want, I wish I could take that back. You know? So uh, there is this uh, very interesting tension how uh, the generation of the 60s and 70s responds to that poverty of, uh, of uh, design quality in the cities that is a result of this exodus to the United States and the trickle-down effect to less quality buildings than what the great uh, proponents had done. Amy, had a question over here, and then to you. How would the construction of these houses that we are looking at as examples hold up against present-day lead designation? Wow. Did everyone hear and understand yeah. the question? I think uh, that's probably very your poor. department. Yeah, well, that's for you, probably that very, very poorly. Quickly. <laughs> orientation in the buildings wasn't often thought about then, so they would overheat just because of the orientation of the glass. They weren't preoccupied with insulation and proper insulation, particularly in the ceilings where most of the heat loss is. So they would be challenged at this point. And so that is what we've learned. The whole building science dew points on how thick are walls, where does the insulation go so that they don't sweat inside the houses. These were houses basically that were very simply made. 
and they didn't think about that technology of the, of the wall section. So the ones that were oriented properly to the sun and had proper amounts of glass and had a balance of inside and outside temperature would be doing better. But as a rule, that wasn't the first idea, was to make them energy efficient. Yeah. I think so it, <laughs> to pick up a, 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 on the historical context yeah. that we were talking about, and this seeing them as hospital architecture, mm -hmm. of course, and Dietrich mentioned tuberculosis, et cetera. So disease, illness, you know, massive epidemics of diseases was really an enormous problem. And uh, a lot of the uh, research that went into these buildings had to do with trying to create buildings that were more sanitary. Mm -hmm. you know, it was mm -hmm. believed that a massive amount of sunlight, uh, this is pre-skin cancer, um, was, you know, would, was healing. So it's responding to a set of criteria that could have perhaps had a kind of health equivalency denomination, like a head domination <laughs> instead of a lead domination. On the other hand, it, I think it also points to, we right there, this, uh, this is a very well-oriented building. Mm -hmm. Hannes Meyer, when he came into the school, completely changed the attitude towards architecture, which is why I believe we cannot speak about a Bauhaus architecture, because Hannes Meyer and Walter Gropius are so radically different from one another, and, and Mies van der Rohe um, equally. But Hannes Meyer began to have the students making diagrams of where the sun came from, what was the course of the sun over the day, how would you take into consideration those mm -hmm. uh, climate uh, and solar factors. Uh, he certainly didn't get anywhere towards a lead standard or even better than a lead standard, a passive house standard, which is an emerging current German uh, standard. But we forget often during this short Meyer period uh, what a, a, a radical scientific basis uh, for architecture was being proposed. That's a very different functionalism than the functionalism of plan, uh, of sure. the uh, exposure of pipes, and so on and so forth. And the certifications are changing. There's a well certification now that does take into consideration how people feel and how they thrive within these spaces, oh. which is about time that we're getting to that. So Amy, you had a question? Hi, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the fact that buyer's work really didn't follow any of the Bauhaus rules. As you look here at the campus, uh, the way he manipulated walls, the accordion walls at the health club, the flared walls at Pepke Auditorium, really and Bernard. maybe one of the best examples of the sun deck, which was so designed for the setting with these deep eaves and a sloped roof. Is it because he was so multidisciplinary, and why weren't others acting like him? So we, we want to be a little careful because Bernard's going to get into this at depth. But Barry did spend a little time in those buildings, and I think you could give us a perspective of the connection where that design came from that was unique to my understanding. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that, by, I think the buyer here was responding very much to this setting and to this place. Uh, I've recently finished a book I was on forever on Breuer. Rob Weissenberger was talking to us earlier, has worked on, on Breuer. Breuer was a much more prolific architect in this mm -hmm. country than he had been uh, before he uh, emigrated, and I don't think that we can hold the American modern ar uh, architecture done by people who pass through the Bauhaus somehow as though it should fit into this slide program and be immediately recognizable as though it's the transportation of 1920s Germany into 1950s um, uh, Colorado. Um, on the other hand, something like the sun deck and sun control and shadow, et cetera, correspond very much to what I was just talking about as being a, a concern of the, of the Bauhaus in the immediate aftermath of Byers' um, period there. I mean, one, one, of my, one of my pet peeves is that just because you went to the Bauhaus doesn't mean for the rest of your life. You've got to constantly to get out your membership card and say, I promise to do everything exactly as I was doing it on the last day I was in Dessau. These people evolved to new challenges, to new contexts, and also the new inspirations. This is a very inspirational place, so I think that Bayer uh, was not going to do what he might have done had he done architecture before he came here. Yeah, there is, oh, quickly, no, no. There is this sense that there is a Bauhaus building, some sort of platonic ideal of a Bauhaus building, and that it should just be picked up from one place to and put to another and look exactly the same. But the reality, I think, has come out over the last day of talks, and I think you're probably getting tired of us hearing it, is that every place that these artists went, every work that they did, they really did adapt to their surroundings. So um, 
Gropius's residences are a good example of that because you have the home he made for himself in Dessau and then the home he made for himself in Lincoln with about 10 years in between them. And for the home in Lincoln, he's very explicit about using field stone, about using cladding, wood cladding, about orienting the house on the site in respect to New England's extreme climates. Um, so he always emphasized the way in which he adapted to local conditions. And I think we could probably, we'll hear that that's yeah. partly what Bayer did and what other Bauhaus, former Bauhaus artists did. So our time is up. And in, in closing, I'd like you all to focus on, and I've heard this back and forth, complicated and complex. And for me, complicated is like the kiss of death. Oh. So if we can focus on complexity within the Bauhaus, we have a way through it. And it is the complexity that has moved through time here. And we are here for and by design. And to echo Robert's, um, closing comments. I would really encourage all of us to look forward in our societal movement and add your piece of design to this ongoing conversation that is much needed in this universal language to get our world going a little better with the river. There you go. <laughs> so, and that's the segue to Bernard. <laughs> Thank you.